Hello and welcome to Welch Lab Chemistry. Today we will be doing the fourth reaction in our series to make an N-annulated perylene diamide dimer, the alkylation of N-annulated perylene diamide. In our paper we give two methods for this reaction, one using conventional heating and one in a microwave. Due to the large scale of this reaction, we will be doing it using conventional heating. For this reaction, you will need NHPDI, which we made in a previous video, potassium carbonate, 1-bromohexane, dimethylformamide, as well as methanol and dichloromethane for washing. First, the NHPDI and potassium carbonate are loaded into a 250 milliliter round bottom flask with a stir bar. The flask is then capped with a septum and purged with nitrogen for 10 minutes. Though we have not directly experienced any problems with air sensitivity for this reaction, previous literature for alkylations of similar materials indicates that it may be a problem. Next, the flask is half filled with dry dimethylformamide. With this reaction, it is important to watch for the color changes. At first, before the stirring is turned on, the reaction mixture is the typical red with yellow fluorescence of PDI materials. Once the stirring is turned on, the potassium carbonate deprotonates the PDI and gives the purple compound we saw last video. This color change can be used as a method to determine the completion of the reaction, as once all the PDI is alkylated, it can no longer be deprotonated and the reaction turns back to the dark red color. While it's still purging with nitrogen, the bead bath is set up and one bromohexane is added via syringe. The reaction is heated to 80 degrees and stirred overnight. While heating, I swirled the flask and you can see the slight purple tinge of the reaction mixture. This will be the primary way we watch the reaction, though TLC can be used for additional monitoring. After 24 hours, the reaction is clearly red when swirled, indicating that all the NHPDI has been consumed. The reaction mixture is also more transparent, which is a result of the higher solubility of N-hexyl PDI as compared to NHPDI. After allowing to cool, the reaction mixture is transferred to a separatory funnel, the stir bar removed, and is extracted with dichloromethane and washed with water. Multiple washings with water and brine can minimize the residual DMF, but the rest of the workup will work if not all the DMF is removed at this point. For the sake of time, multiple washings are not shown. After multiple washings with water and then with brine, the organic phase is dried with magnesium sulfate. The dry reaction mixture is filtered through a short silica plug to remove the magnesium sulfate as well as small impurities. After the product has been filtered through the silica, a grey purple band is left on the plug under the white magnesium sulfate but near the top of the silica. This band is probably residual impurities from the previous reaction, and by using a silica plug at this stage we can remove almost all impurities before we even isolate a crude product. The solvent is then removed on a rotovap to give a red sludge. The sludge would be very difficult to isolate as is, but we have found a trick that is very effective in these situations. First, the sludge is fully dissolved with some dichloromethane. Next, some methanol is added to the mixture. This sets up a system where we have a solvent with a lower boiling point than the counter solvent that is also present. Now the solvent is partially removed on the rotovap. Since the dichloromethane is removed preferentially, the concentration of methanol increases until the product crashes out of solution. Using this method, we are left with a fine precipitate that is not solidly adhered to the side of the flask, and the filtration is much easier. The product is then filtered with a Buchner funnel and washed with methanol. The filtrate is quite dark and does contain some dissolved product. Since the filtrate is darker than normal, it was saved until after the product was isolated and I was able to confirm that I had recovered most of the product. In my previous videos, I have placed a bit of paper towel or aluminum foil under my product beaker while I transfer my product. I do this as a good standard practice so that if some product misses the beaker, I can transfer the product easily back to the beaker without fear of contaminating it with whatever may be on the bottom of my fume hood. After isolation, we are left with about 4.3 grams of product, which corresponds to a 90% yield. 
In this case, the mass was lost in two places, the silica plug, which removed impurities, as well as in the filtrate. Since a high yield of 90% was achieved, the filtrate was disposed into the organic waste without further attempts to isolate more product. To confirm the purity, we can examine the proton in MR. As usual, we can see water at 1.5 ppm and chloroform at 7.26 ppm. For the spectrum, the new characteristic proton is at just under 5 ppm and corresponds to the NCH protons in the hexyl chain. Thank you for watching, and I hope you can join us next time for the bromination of NHexyl PDI. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more synthesis videos.